Hear that? Is that America cheering or a sausage patty sizzling to perfection? It's time to cheer for Egg McMuffin and fresh cracked eggs at McDonald's. It's time to wake up to the aroma of freshly baked biscuits and treat yourself to a real honest-to-goodness morning meal. Breakfast, it's on at McDonald's. Now enjoy a large iced coffee for just 2 bucks and a breakfast sandwich to make a meal. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. Hey everybody, Joel here at the top of the show. Today's sermon that we have on this specific episode was narrated by John Rayner. And John has his own podcast called Pre-Game Proverb. And at the end of this episode, we're going to play a, a segment from it and talk about it a little bit more in the credits of the show. So stick around after the show to hear about something else you might be interested in. Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy and Joel, and you are listening to Revive Thoughts. The gospel which we have in our hands. This is a gospel of such astonishing mystery, of such heavenly majesty, and of such perfect purity, that it can be nothing less than the Word of God. Every episode, we bring you a different voice from history in a sermon that they deliver today. We're hearing a sermon that was titled, What Can I Do to Be Saved? It was preached by Cotton Mather in the late 1600s, possibly the early 1700s. This would have been preached colonial America. We're going way back uh, before the birth of America to hear a sermon by Cotton Mather. Troy, um, I hear some some crickets out there, some ambiance of, yeah. of the Cambodian uh, jungle side there. How's, <laughs> how's it going over there? It's going well. So yeah, those of you who are maybe newer to the program or have uh, not caught up in a while, my wife and I and our children, we moved to Cambodia about two months ago. And we've been settling in here. Things are going well. Honestly, the rainy season looks like it might be coming to an end soon. And that is really nice because it rains Every single day, multiple times a day. I I am from coastal Florida, and I'm not I'm not shy to a few thunder showers. But let me tell you, I I did not know rain until I moved to Cambodia. So we're looking forward to some sunshine here soon. Joel, when you hear the name Cotton Mather, you probably think about the Salem witch trials. Maybe uh, you know, and we here at Revive Thoughts, we've done a deep dive. It's an hour and a half long episode on the Salem witch trials. If you'd like to go preview that, you can find it in the in the episodes. Uh, but the full episode is available for our Patreon listeners on the deep dive premium feed there. And we talked about questions about the demonic and the spiritual elements. What was we really tried to get to the bottom from a Christian perspective? What was going on in Salem? and what happened and we really read through it was honestly a lot of research it was a really interesting fun episode to produce however cotton uh mather he he um doesn't really get a lot of play on his own he really usually is only associated with this one event so here in this episode we're going to kind of bypass that salem witch rounds we've already talked about that with him in our studio and we will also kind of I want to put some focus on a, some different aspects of him, some sides of him you don't really get to hear as often. But again, if you do want to know more about that part of his life, we did a pretty good episode. So I do encourage you go check out that deep dive, um, either find it on Patreon or go preview it first. Yeah. Now is is you, Mather the pronunciation that we're sticking with, or we, is it? Because I, I, I thought default it was to Mather. I've always heard it as Mather, but I we looked it up on YouTube and at least it, it, three different videos said Mather. And she said Mather. So. I might bounce between them subconsciously, unintentionally. Yeah, mather, yeah. mather, 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 cotton mather. Because when we did mather. the episode on Salem with Trials, we did say Mather. So, you know, I, I was about know. to say, I'm used to calling him Mather, but Cotton Mather, uh, he gets a bad reputation. You know, he was that Puritan that was that executioner. He goes down in history uh, and he stands out in history quite a bit. But there is a lot more to him uh, than that chapter of his life. And it's, he, he has, he's a very interesting man. He's a very complex man. There's a lot to his, uh, his character. And one of the things we always say with really old characters in history is that this is, this, his life happened a long time ago. Mathers grew up 400 years ago. This America was still being discovered. Wars were happening. The United States was over 100 years from its conception. And so whenever we talk about uh, people from history, we always try to keep them in the context of things were different. Uh, it was a long time ago. Mathers was born in 1663 in Boston, and his dad was a very famous preacher at the time. His name was Increase Mather. And he was related to two giants in the Puritan families. John Cotton, who uh, he, he was named after Cotton, John Cotton, 
Cotton Mather and Richard Mather, who we might we might uh, we might look into a bit more in uh, in the future. He's kind of there's kind of like this really interesting parallel between I think Cotton's life and Jonathan Edwards's lives. If you've listened to a few of our episodes, I really do recommend go checking out Jonathan Edwards. He has a really interesting life too. Just lots of things happened. Uh, he he kind of we 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 go through several of his episodes um, and a lot of his life stories. But I see just a real strong parallel to these two men who were both born in New England, both before America was started, and both of them were very very intelligent. Both of them are like student prodigies. Cotton goes to Harvard at 11. Now, granted, Harvard back then was different than Harvard now. I don't know that they would let an 11-year-old in now, so I don't know that we could see a repeat of this. But still, the fact is, he was quite young. I mean, I think of myself at 11, and I was not some great student prodigy who learned languages on the side just for fun, basically, uh, and loved to study, loved to read, extremely intelligent man. And he's much like Jonathan Edwards. These two guys were just gifted at a very young age and were incredible, incredible students. We'll mention Jonathan Edwards a bit, too. These guys just have kind of an overlap in their lives because Jonathan Edwards, you know, he... Uh, he actually lived with they were their contemporaries that overlapped. So when Jonathan Edwards was 25 was when Cotton died. So they, they do actually have a lot of reasons why they seem similar. And I'm convinced, and I think you might be too when you listen to this sermon, that Jonathan Edwards, or at least the Puritans in general, they had a certain style of preaching, especially in New England. It's very heartfelt. It's very much centered on salvation and knowing the Lord before you die. And you'll listen to the sermon and some of it looked through some of his other sermons. I could switch them on you. I could kind of change them up. I could not tell you who is Jonathan Edwards and who is Cotton. And I think you would have a hard time figuring out who is whose because they do have a lot of similarities. They have very similar styles. And I wonder if that's because maybe it's possible Edwards looked up to him or at least that style that he was doing. And there's a reason why they, he would go on to repeat it himself. These two men also both loved science. They were very, very passionate about science. And Cotton was the first writer in one of his many books that he would write was the first American science textbook. And so that was a big deal to him. He would graduate at the age of 15. I think he published that textbook a little bit later, by the way. But he would graduate at the age of 15 and he felt called to ministry. He wanted to co-labor with his father, Increase, but Increase was a cold, a kind of distant man. This is even from his congregation. And he treated his son similarly, just kind of cold from all accounts. His father was not interested in really working with his son, the young and gifted prodigy student. However, the congregation had a say, and they said, we want Cotton. Cotton is uh, friendly, he's open, he's hospitable, he's warm, he's everything we want in a pastor. You know, increase, you're great as well. You're, you know, extremely talented in all these areas, but the w- places you're not good at, you know, praying for the sick, visiting the congregant members, teaching the kids the catechisms, these kind of things that you're bad at, increase, are the things that Cotton is really, really good at. And so they saw him as just a great pairing together. And so for a while, the two of them would preach together and work together in the same church until eventually Cotton would find his own church, um, you know, over in Salem. Cotton, he was a writer. He wrote lots of books, over 450 writings in his lifetime. Not all of them were published. Some of them were published a bit later. Uh, There was a work of his that eventually got published way in the 1900s. That was a 4,500-page Bible commentary. Imagine writing 45. Imagine writing a book that's three times the size of a standard Bible, and uh, you have no typewriter and or computer to do that. Like, that's handwritten. And you don't that's, even publish it. You just, you just, that's just written just because. I mean, Yeah, yeah. It's not until 300 years later that someone would be like, hey, we should publish this. Some of these books uh, would, would go on to be really important. For example, in the Mangla Christi Americana. How did I do that, Troy? How was that? I think it's Magnalia. I looked at, like, you know, if you look, think of Ma- Magnolia, and then there's an A there, so mm. Mag- Magnalia is how I said it in my head. That logic checks out. Mag- <laughs> Magnolia Christi Americana uh, was the title of the work. He pointed out that the second and third generation Puritans were, were already forgetting dreams and passions for God that their parents, who had sailed to America, had and he called them out on it uh you know he called them to to return to god we also mentioned his love of science you know he he published that science textbook some other things he did uh he kind of brings us two big contributions to the science of that era the first 
was he did the first ever plant hybridization experiment. And if you're a farmer, you're going, oh, yeah, yeah, I know all about that, you know, with the, with the, the farm plants. But if you're like me and you had no idea what that was, he basically would li- he lined up some corn. He put the blue in one row and, like, the red in the other and left a row in between them, I guess, or something, and basically watched them cross-pollinate and was like, oh, interesting. When I put these two different types of corn together, I get this new type of corn. Let me continue to cross-pollinate them and see what kind of corns I can grow. So he was the first person to ever experiment and intentionally write down his results. I mean, there might have been farmers in the past who did this before on their own, but he was the first one who wrote it down and was like, this is what happens when you cross-pollinate plants, which is a pretty big deal. I mean, the corn back then was blue, red, and yellow, and I don't know about you, but or like an orange and all these other colors, and now when you think of corn, it's gold, yellow, partially because people cross-pollinized and did this until they got the corn they wanted. So an interesting contribution. He just, he again, he was just a very interested in science. But the other one's probably, in some ways, again, more famous for this one. And this one came with its own controversies. Uh, during an outbreak in Boston of smallpox in 1721, he helped to really push the idea of inoculations. And I'm going to be honest, Joel, before this episode, I had no idea what the difference between a vaccination or an inoculation was. I, I did not know they were different. But... They are, and apparently uh, Cotton had learned from a slave that he had, and yes, we he did have slaves. That was something he had as well, and we could probably spend more time on that, but there's only so much in an episode. Um, but he learned from a slave that he had that in Africa, they don't really have any problem with smallpox, and when he asked them why that was, it, he said it was because they inoculated the people against them. They took a little bit of the infection. They took like a tiny piece of the skin of the infected person who has smallpox, and they put it in the skin of other people. And the body, according to the science and the theory, would build up immunities fighting it on the skin before it got into like the lungs and other places. And so that way, when smallpox came to get them, they would already have the immunity built up to fight it. Uh, Cotton thought this was great science, great idea. And apparently this had been going on in India since the 1200s and as far back as China since the 800s. So this is an old scientific medical practice from that side of the world. He decided he wanted to try this. People people had died of smallpox several times over the years um, during different outbreaks. He didn't want it to happen again. And he knew that they knew about a little bit about at least viral immunity. So they tried it and they found that they actually were kind of successful that uh, most of the people, I mean, by and large, large numbers of the people that they inoculated did not die. I think they had out of 300 people that they gave smallpox to, only six of them died. But of course, you may have heard gave smallpox to, and that is what they were doing. They were giving them smallpox. And a lot of people, especially other Puritans, were not okay with that. They said, look, if someone gets smallpox out in the wild, that's, you know, God's providence has brought that upon them, perhaps. But you're giving them the smallpox. Like you're forcing them to be in a situation, you know, basically, if I put you in a ring with a bear, um, when you weren't going to run into a bear, trying to train you how to fight a bear, and then you get eaten by a bear, isn't that my fault? You know, this, this idea of I put you in danger, and then you got sick and died. On a non-statistical level, that was on me. And so it, huge fights broke out. This was a huge controversy. And yet Boston, for the most part, went forward with these inoculations. Inoculations. It's important to note that cotton was not the first person to invent inoculations. Again, they were in Africa, India, and China at the time. But he was a huge proponent and a big leader of bringing them to the West. He brought them to kind of America, and from there they spread out. And eventually George Washington would use this on the Revolutionary Army. It would become a very popular thing for a time before eventually being replaced by the actual smallpox uh, vaccine. However, despite all these different things and controversies, and that, and that's really, I think, the problem with Cotton, was he never got to be quite as popular as his father, Increase. Uh, Increase's height and prestige, he was, I mean, the leading figure pretty much in the New England world of Puritanism. He was a big deal on both sides of the Atlantic. Cotton never really got there, and I think it's because Cotton was always involved in controversies like inoculation and like, of course, the very famous Salem witch trials. And this thing that happened in the early 1690s when he was 29 haunted him for the rest of his days, and these kind of things just followed him, and he could not really shake what was going on. It was a real problem for him, and he just could not stop himself from getting pulled into these controversies, and I think this just kept him from ever truly being as popular as his father. A shop owner who hated cotton. I mean, this guy 
hated him, but he also hated anything uh, supernatural, would end up writing a book about Cotton, basically making up just tons of rumors and stories and things, making all kinds of stuff that nobody at the time believed. And if they had believed, I mean, Cotton would have probably been killed. I mean, there were some pretty nasty, terrible things that this guy made up. And he published this book and, you know, enemies of his bought it and laughed at it. It's kind of, you know, joke basically because it was so unrealistic. Yet, in the 1800s, New England and the people of New England were giving up on Puritanism and they were leaving the old way of doing things at church, all the Presbyterian, all that stuff was going away in New England. And when these people wanted to rebel against their parents and society and stuff like that, they chose to basically use the Salem witch trials as the target of all Puritanism. Basically, all Puritanism is just the Salem witch trials. And if you're going to use the Salem Witch Trials as your target, who uh, better than Cotton to make the villain? And so from literature like the Scarlet Letter uh, to paintings, everything you had, they would put Cotton in it. He was the quintessential Puritan preacher in their mind. Sometimes he would even be like an old man in these paintings, even though he was 29 at the time. And this all did, of course, terrible damage to his reputation. People did not want to study him or have anything to do with this guy because they saw him as this crazy, horrible Puritan from an era a long, long time ago. And his reputation has really quite never recovered from that damage that was done in the 1800s. And that book that I mentioned earlier by the shop owner was republished and shared and people took it very seriously in the 1800s because of the damage that it did. They were, again, just kind of being young rebels, kind of throwing off the shackles of the religion they had known all their lives and were moving towards liberalism and all these things. And they, again, were using that caricature of poor Cotton from that shop owner who didn't like him to kind of ruin his reputation. Now, I've seen people say and mention that the New England Puritans really don't have anything on the English Puritans, and that Puritanism was really an English thing. But the people in New England, the people in the colonies, did have a lot to add. And sadly, for the most part, they've kind of been relegated to a side story of history, and they've kind of been ignored. And their entire reputation has, for some people, quite truly hung on just the Salem Witch Trials. And I think that's a great shame. I think in this sermon you're going to listen to in a minute, you'll see that there's actually a lot more to them than that. Yeah, like we said, there, there's a lot to cotton mathers and um i mean some of the criticism towards him are are valid you know our are, are understanding but uh he gets swept under the rug and he gets you know no one takes a second to another second to look into what kind of a man he was and and it's a shame because it's it's fascinating and i think it's a good uh, a good knowledge to have in your arsenal of church history for sure and we didn't get into a lot of his own personal life. For example, he was well acquainted with death, a lot of death. He had three wives over the course of his life. Out of the 15 kids that he had, only two of them would survive to adulthood. Because, again, this is colonial America. These people are getting off boats. There are winters where they're starving to death. Like, it's it's harsh living conditions. This is before we are, are really well established on the mainland. There was one article that uh, described Cotton this way. It said, The modern Mather scholars see a very human figure, contemplative, assiduous, haughty, self-deprecating, idealistic, brilliant, faltering, stuttering Christian, entranced with glory of Jesus Christ. He didn't have a great relationship with his father. Increase, uh, he, he was actually the president of Harvard and Cotton actually helped establish its chief rival Yale. So if that gives you some kind of context for their relationships <laughs> where they where they found rivaling schools. But one thing his dad did teach him and one thing that really seemed to stick with him is just a, a base defining love for Jesus Christ. His dad told him early on to not worry about all the teaching and learning he had done in school, but to fill his sermons with the person of Jesus Christ through and through, and Cotton did that. And for all of his flaws in ministry, few who have studied or read him doubt that he loved Jesus Christ and wanted to bring him glory. What must I do to be saved? It is impossible to ask a more weighty question. It is a shame that it is asked more frequently and with more agony in our hearts. 
The spirit of slumber, which is the poison of the old serpent, has brought upon the children of men, is to be halted. Awaken us out of this terrible stupidity, O God of all grace, so we do not perish eternally. My design is to bring a good and full answer to this weighty question. Oh, how thankful we are to be for the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which makes us able to answer it. The gospel which we have in our hands. This is a gospel of such astonishing mystery, of such heavenly majesty, and of such perfect purity, that it can be nothing less than the word of God. It must be of a divine author. Oh, highly favored people who know this joyful sound. Oh, unmistakably and inexcusably wretched if we ignore its words. The devils knew that those excellent ministers of the Lord Paul and Silas were to come to Philippi with a design to answer this weighty question. They could not bear it. They feared it would cause destruction upon their kingdom there. They stirred up the minds of some wicked people to abuse and revile these ministers and send them into prison. Some wicked people were afraid that they would lose a little money by the coming of such ministers among them. And the devils inspired these worms to use incessant tricks until they had made these ministers incapable of preaching any more by them. Our glorious Lord appeared for his faithful servants. They glorified him in the midst of their trials. They sang his praises under the attacks and the chains which the satanic party inflicted on them. O oh, patient servants of the Lord, what scars do you have to show that you will one day reign in glory with him? These poor men sang for the Lord. The Lord heard them and saved them. A terrible earthquake at midnight shook open the doors of their prison. The keeper over the keys of the prison was terrified. In his bewilderment, he falls down at the feet of his prisoners, and he treats them no longer as prisoners, but rather as angels. He passionately puts to them the question, and oh, that we could hear it with more frequency among us. What must I do to be saved? Some learned men think that the jailer had the traditions of their philosophers conceived some hope of a better life, and seeing his life here in danger... He does what a distressed wretch would do in the last minutes of their life and cries out for some help to make sure of a better life. Or more likely, the recent words of the possessed young woman in the town that had been spoken about by these ministers came to him. These men are the servants of the Most High God, who shows us the way of salvation. These thoughts might run in his mind and remind him of that salvation and make him think. But he still has one important question. What must be done? This should be the eager inquiry of all men so that they might be saved. What must he do that he may be saved? We will proceed upon the awakening examples of this thing. Examples more powerful than any thunderbolts. Oh, that the issue might be, that the hearers might be awakened with a mighty impression upon their souls to make that inquiry. What must I do to be saved? You must know that there is a great salvation proposed for the sinful children of men, and you must know and think that there is nothing of greater concern for any man as obtaining a part in that great salvation. Indeed, knowledge is the first thing that is necessary in order to salvation, and it is absolutely necessary, unspeakably necessary. We read in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, of people destroyed for their lack of knowledge. Ah, destructive ignorance! What will be done to chase you out of the world? A world which by you is rendered a dark world. The kingdom of darkness. The oracles of wisdom have assured us the soul without knowledge is not good. They assured us those who do not know God have a vengeance in flaming fire ahead of them. They have assured us it is life eternal to know the only true God and Jesus Christ that he has sent. An ignorance of the true gospel will lead to a long train of unknown but very evil consequences. It is the gospel of salvation that those are ignorant of it will miss the means of salvation. It is a terrible and pernicious principle that a man may be saved from any religion as long as he lives according to it. The unerring and infallible gospel has stated otherwise in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. If our gospel be hid, it is hid for them that are lost. Knowledge, knowledge, oh, to get good knowledge. Let that be the first care of those who would be saved. Knowledge, it is a principal thing. My child, get knowledge. With all your might, get understanding. Oh, 
that this resolution might immediately be made in the minds of our people. I will get as much knowledge as I can. The word of God must be read and heard with diligence so that you may arrive at the knowledge that you need. The catechisms in which you may have the word of God fitted for your more early apprehension of it must be diligently studied too. For all the other means of knowledge, there must be added humble and earnest supplications before the glorious Lord. You must cry to God for knowledge and lift up your voice to him for understanding. Prefer it to silver or before any earthly treasures. There are some who are so very ignorant that they do not know how to pray. I would advise them to take the 119th Psalm. They will find in it many a prayer suited for any of their circumstances. Take it, use it, and particularly those petitions to God in it. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes. And Lord, teach me good judgment and knowledge. And Lord, give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. Give me understanding and I will live. Take encouragement from that word and plead it before the Lord. James chapter 1 verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men generously and do not doubt it, and it will be given to him. And now to pursue different thoughts at once. I am to tell you that the main things which it is necessary for you to know are the things which concern salvation. Most importantly, you must know, first, from what do you need salvation? And here first, you must know that the Eternal One and Infinite God who subsists in three persons in which His Word calls the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that He created our first parents in a holy and happy state at the end of the six days in which he created all things. But our first parents, listening to the temptations of wicked spirits, ate a forbidden fruit. And by that sin they fell from God, and from their holy and happy state. And their fall has brought their children with them into a state of sin and misery. For their sin was our sin. And from their corrupt nature... We are born into the world poisoned with such a nature ourselves. The death which God's broken law threatened for them is now due for us all, a death which intends all misery, not only in this world, but in another, where our souls continue immortal after they have left this world. Then you need to know that there is a law given to us, which is the everlasting rule, according to which God requires us to glorify Him, a law of love to God and man contained in our Ten Commandments. But you break this law every day, and every breach of it incurs the wrath of God, for His eyes are too pure to behold evil, and cannot look upon any iniquity. Lastly, you need to know that while you lie under the guilt of sin, you are also under the power of of sin, and under the reign of Satan too. It is the most woeful oppression from the worst of enemies that can be. God is at odds with you. He won't give you his great consolations. All things are against you. The things that appear for your welfare are only there to ensnare you more. Their job is to poison you. They only create further distance from God. Your very prosperity hurts you. Your adversary lays the chains of death upon you. You are every moment in danger of being seized by the formidable justice of God for eternal burnings. If you die... Hi, it's John Taffer from Bar Rescue. Did you know the second building in America was a tavern? When I built my new restaurant franchise concept, Taffer's Tavern, I thought back to the roots of what makes a tavern a tavern. Timeless character. All while delivering an unbelievably delicious food and beverage experience. That paired with my 40 plus years in the industry provides a clear roadmap to success. Do you have what it takes to be a Taffer's Tavern franchisee? If so, I'd love to hear from you. Visit franchise.tafferstavern.com. If you've got a passion for pumpkin, you've got to get to Dunkin' and pick these up. Our new pumpkin cream cold brew. Smooth, bold cold brew topped with velvety pumpkin cream cold foam. And our delicious pumpkin spice signature latte. Rich espresso topped with whipped cream, caramel drizzle, and cinnamon sugar. And our perfectly pumpkin donuts, munchkin treats, pumpkin muffins, and more. That's how we pumpkin at Dunkin'. Pick your pumpkin at Dunkin', like our new pumpkin cream cold 
cold brew, pumpkin spice signature latte, and our perfectly pumpkin treats. America runs on Dunkin'. Price and participation may vary. Limited time offer. Exclusions apply. Unpardoned, you are sent among devils, damned to torments. You must undergo a unique punishment and a long one, which is reserved into eternity for all the unrepentant sinners. O oh, sinner, this is your lamentable case. And knowing this, how can you do anything other than ask that question? What must I do to be saved? Knowing this terror of the Lord, oh, be persuaded. The second thing you must know is by whom you may have salvation. You must know the mystery of godliness, God manifested flesh. Your salvation depends on your knowing of this Savior. We have not the least inclination in the book of God that an unknown Savior will be ours. But it is dreadfully told us that if people have no understanding of him, he that made them will not have mercy on them. He that formed them will show them no favor. So you have to know the Son of God that is the blessed Jesus, he who was born sinless from the Virgin Mary and who lived a sinless life. And this admirable person, who is God and man in one person, has fulfilled the law of God for us. It finished the precept of it in his righteous life, and it finished the penalty of it in his grievous death. He suffered the cross and endured the curse in our stead. You need to know this mighty and matchless and only Savior of the world, who is also governor of the world. You need to know he is risen from the dead, and he is enthroned in the heavens and will return to rule and judge the world. But he will save the worst of all that come to God by him. O oh, undone sinner, can you hear of such a Savior and not ask the question, What must I do that I may have a part in the Savior? The third thing you must know is what will be done for you if you find salvation. You are to know that no good thing will be withheld from the saved of the Lord. Wonder, wonder, be swallowed up with wonderment at this grace. There is an offer for you, a deliverance from all the undesirable circumstances into which you have run by departure from your God. It is offered to you that you will no longer be the children of death, but be made the children of God, that you will be forgiven and accepted with a reconciled God and be followed with perpetual testimonies of his fatherly love, that no iniquity will have dominion over you, but you will become the amiable temples wherein he will dwell with the sweet influences of his good spirit forever irradiating out of you. It is offered for you that your spirits at your death will put on the garments of life and enter into the peace arrest rest of heavenly paradise, that your bodies will be a part of resurrection that will be restored to your spirits, but be the lively, the lovely, the most agreeable and everlasting mansions for them, that you will have a joyful portion in the city of God and have his marvelous kindness forever doing unutterable things for you. In that strong city, there you will at length be filled with all the fullness of God and have God become all in all for you forever and ever. All this is contained in the salvation therein. You have a tender salvation. It is a comprehensive word as incomprehensible good. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, no heart can conceive what is laid up in the salvation of God. O oh, ruined sinner, why does it not now become your inquiry? What must I do that I may not lose the vast things of which I am invited by my Savior? These are the things that must be known. And if these things be known and understood, the plain thought from them will be this, that the man is insane and unworthy to be called a reasonable man who is not asking, what must I do to be saved? But now it is the time to answer that great inquiry. We will do it by calling in a second proposition. Two, something must be done by every man that would not forfeit or reject all hope of the great salvation. 
And this also must be known. You must know what must be done. And thereupon it will be said to you, Job chapter 13, verse 17, When you know these things, happy are you if you do them. It is not enough to know. There must be action joined with your knowledge. Something must be done, or else it had never been said. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 6, Christ is the author of eternal salvation. For all them that obey him, something must be done, or else we had never been told. Hebrews 6, 9, there are the things that accompany salvation. We are often instructed in these sacred writings that there is a way, wherein alone salvation is to be expected, a way called the way of life and the way of truth the way of the Lord, and the way of peace, and the way of the righteous. In this way, something must be done. There are steps to be taken that we may find this way and keep this way. This is the everlasting way. There is no altering of it. Something must be done. For we are sure all men are not saved. There are some who are children of perdition. There are some who are vessels of wrath. There are some who go away into everlasting punishment. Something must be done. To distinguish you from that crooked generation, we read Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. Narrow is the way which leads to life, and few are those that find it. Indeed, there is nothing to be done by us to merit our salvation, but something must be done to secure our salvation. Indeed, there is nothing to be done by us in our own strength, but something must be done by us through Christ who strengthens us. More plainly, our blessedness now comes not from us on the terms of a covenant of works. It is not properly our doings. That is the condition of our blessedness. We are to be saved by taking rather than by doing. The condition is to receive and be saved. It is approved and be saved or be willing to be saved. We speak of doing in the largest sense of the word. And we still say, something must be done that we may be saved. Let the question then come in, and oh, bring it with all the solicitude which were proper for the greatest concern in the world. A sound doctrine, what must I do to be saved? I have seen this question answered terribly in pamphlets that have been scattered about our nation. The one thing that is necessary has been left unregarded, unmentioned. Perhaps the noting of certain superstitious holidays has been recommended instead of that one thing. And now have the souls of men been betrayed by men unskillful in the word of righteousness. How unskillfully and unfaithfully have the methods of salvation been declared by many who pervert the gospel of Christ. Not so now, I hope. A pure gospel, a sound doctrine must be pursued. You are to be treated with nothing but wholesome words, nothing but the faithful sayings of God. And what better, what other answer can be given to this question but what the apostles of God gave it to of old? When the poor man said, what must I do to be saved? We read they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This is the sum of the gospel. This is the charge given to the ministers of the gospel. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes will be saved. The faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the only Savior, this must be found in all that will be saved. This faith is a completion of the mind in the way of salvation by a glorious Christ revealed in the gospel. This faith, by which we deny ourselves and rely on a glorious Christ for all salvation. This faith by which we receive a glorious Christ and rest on him for salvation as he is offered for us. But how must this faith work in all those who will be saved? Oh, set your heart to these things. They are not vain things. Your lives, the very lives of your souls, are dependent on them. If your hearts will now surrender to these things and be formed and shaped according to the evangelical mold of them, then this day salvation will come for your souls. Glorious Lord, Incline the hearts of our people to do what must be done so that your salvation may be bestowed upon them. First, this must be done. You must come to a bitterly conscious that you lack a glorious Christ for your Savior. We read John chapter 7, verse 37. If any man thirsts, let him come to me. Truly, 
No man will come to Christ until a thirst or a pungent and painful sense of the lack of Christ be raised to him. You must feel the burden of your sin lying on you and cry out, Oh, it is a heavy burden that is too heavy for me. You must see God is angry with you. Sin is binding on you. Hell is gaping open for you. And the utter despair of helping yourselves out of the confusion that has come upon you. You must be filled with sorrow for what you have done, with horror at what you are doing. The cry of your uneasy souls must be that of Romans chapter 7, verse 24. O wretched man that I am who will deliver me. You must be no strangers to phrases like these. I have sinned, I have sinned, and woe is upon me that I have sinned. I have lost the knowledge of God and lost the image of God and lost the favor of God. My sin renders me obnoxious to the vengeance of God. Lust enchants me. It enslaves me. Satan tyrannizes over me. I am in hourly hazard of eternal banishment from God into the outer darkness, into the place of dragons. O wretched man that I am, I can do nothing to deliver myself. I will perish, I will perish perish unless a glorious Christ is my deliverer. And this also must be done. You must confess. You must confess yourself unable to do anything effectively by yourself when coming to a glorious Christ as your Savior. With a fearful trembling of soul, you must make this profession. Lord, you work in us to will and do of your own good pleasure. Your profession must be that of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. By grace you are saved through faith that not of yourselves, but it is the gift of God. Your profession must be that of John chapter 6, verse 65. No man can come unless it is given to him. O oh, lie at the foot of sovereign grace, confessing and imploring, Lord. I am justly destroyed if I do not sincerely renounce my sin, sincerely embrace my Savior, but I cannot, oh, I cannot, I have deadly chains upon my soul. I will never answer your gracious calls except your sovereign grace enables me. Oh, quicken me. Oh, strengthen me. Oh, enable me. Turn me to you, and I will be turned. Your impotency must not be an excuse for your impenitency. Your inability must terrify you completely. Let it affect you completely. It may not let you slide into lazy negligence. Having first cried out to God that he would help you to do what you have to do, You must now try to do it. This must be done. You must admire, you must adore, you must address a glorious Christ in all his positions for all his benefits. Oh, hear a compassionate Redeemer calling you. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22. Look to me, all you ends of the earth, and you will be saved. Comply, reply, Lord, I look to you, and I will be yours. Save me. And hear... You are to remember that the first thing you want is atonement and acceptance with God. For this purpose, you must behold a glorious Christ, a priest bringing a sacrifice and making a righteousness for you accordingly. Your first address to heaven must be this, Lord, let my many and horrid sins be forgiven me for the sake of that great sacrifice which you had in the blood of Jesus Christ your Son, which cleanses from all sin. And Lord, let me who is a poor sinner, utterly hopeless of working out for myself a righteousness, now stand before you in the wondrous righteousness of of that Lord, who is head of his church, and who has wrought out a spotless righteousness for us. But remember to depend on this sufficient sacrifice in righteousness, for you are not qualified for it by any good thing to be observed in yourselves. Do not believe it came because of some commendable goodness in yourselves. No, depend and trust upon it, as encouraged by no other qualification but this. A most miserable sinner, yet you are invited and compelled into the mercy of Christ. If the faith has gotten this far and it is not a counterfeit, it won't stop here. You must behold a glorious Christ as a prophet and a king. Faith has other needs from the Savior besides the desire to be justified. A true believer will not count himself saved if he is not sanctified as well as justified. The Savior puts this demand to you. Matthew chapter 20, verse 32. What will you ask that I will do for you? You answer, O my great Savior, I come to you that by your being my sacrifice and my righteousness and my advocate that I may be saved fully. But this must not be all. There must be this in the answer. 
O my Savior, I come to you for instruction. Let your spirit with your word cause me to know the things of my peace and keep me from all delusions. And there must be this in the answer. O my Savior, I come to you for power. Let your spirit of grace conquer the hate of my heart and make me a conqueror over all my spiritual adversaries. This is that faith. That is of the saved of the soul. Believe after this manner, and you will believe in the saving of the soul. For a true faith will always have repentance accompanying it, repentance to life, for it is a dead faith which cannot show it, a dead soul that does not have it. A genuine faith is always a repenting faith. We see two sisters hand in hand, Acts chapter 20, verse 21, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. We constantly see it in the experience of all the faithful. It is denomination of repentance, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, repentance to salvation. It must be found in all the candidates of salvation, so you must heartily and bitterly bewail all your sins, your original sin, your actual sin, the monstrous aggravation of your sin, you must be convinced of it. A contrition must follow this conviction. With a broken heart, you must cry out, Psalms chapter 38, verse 18, I will declare my iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. You must mourn for your sin and mourn for the offense given to God by your sin as well as for the mischief done to yourselves. Mourn, mourn, and never believe that you have mourned enough. And you must make a penitent confession of your sins, a remorseful confession of them. All your known crimes, you must as particularly as you can, confess with shame and grief before the Lord. You must be able to say, Psalm chapter 51, verse 3, I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. And where your sins are known, where your neighbors have been either sufferers by or witnesses of your misdeeds, they also should know that you acknowledge them. And this must be done. Every way of sin must be abhorred, must be avoided, must be forsaken. So you are warned by God's in the Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13. He that confesses and forsakes will find mercy. If you go in any known way of sin, you will find it a way of death, a path of the destroyer. Very tremendous things will be done to those enemies of God who go still on their trespasses. Have you done something wrong? You must say, I will do so no more, and you must not persist in what you have done. And here, if you've wronged another man in what you've done, you must vigorously attempt all possible restitution. Restitution, a thing too little understood, a thing too little commanded, and a thing too little practiced often without which there can be no right repentance. This is the repentance which is found in every true believer. It must be found in everyone that would be saved. And holiness, holiness, a patient continuance in good doing. There is no life in the faith which is not productive to a holy life. It is not a faith in which will bring to everlasting life, If the grace to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ be infused into the soul, the habit of every other grace is at that same instant infused. I will show you the motto on the golden gates of the holy city. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. A holy life, a life pressing after universal and perpetual conformity to the rules of holiness. This is the royal path leading to salvation. Yes, this is no little part of our salvation. This must be done. You must resign yourselves up to the Holy Spirit of the Lord. Consent, request, entreat that he would eternally take possession of you. From the dust cry out to him. Psalms 141.10 You are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me to the land of rectitude. Cry out to him. O spirit of holiness, raise me out of the ruins that my sin has brought upon me. Possess me forever. Cause me to fear God and love Christ and hate sin. Let me forget this world, and let me meet the inheritance of the saints in light. Bring me to be one of them. I pray you, I pray you. There is a good foundation of holiness laid in this resignation. But then, this must be done. You must heartily pursue the death of every sin. You must fly to the death of your Savior as the purchase and the model of so great a blessing that you must count no trouble too much to be undergone, that you may come at such a blessing. This is the holiness without which no man will see the Lord. This must be done. You must set yourself before the examples of your Savior. 
Study how he was in the world. Study to walk as he walked. Mightily delight in every tiniest resemblance in him. Yes, even if it is in suffering that you resemble him. This is that holiness without which no man will see the Lord. This must be done. You must, by a solemn dedication of yourselves and your all to the Lord, become the Lord's. It must therefore be your desire to have all your talents, all your possessions and enjoyments and interests employed for the honor of the Lord. And you must be ready to submit to the will of God when he pleases to bring afflictive periods to take blessings from you. This is the holiness without which no man will see the Lord. This must be done. You must remember that the eye of the omnipotent God is upon you. You must often bring this to remembrance. God sees me, hears me, knows me, and is acquainted with all my ways. A sense of your being under the notice of God and of the account to which you will be called by God must make you afraid of incurring his displeasure, afraid even of secret misdeeds and sins. This is that holiness without which no man will see the Lord. This must be done. You must make it your practice to keep a conscience clear of offense towards God and towards man. You must labor to be acquainted with all your duties, and your understanding with the will of God must be followed with proportional desires and laborers after obedience to it. You must pray always with all prayer, with secret prayer, with household prayer, with public prayer. You must take a high value on those two sacraments of the New Testament, the baptism and the supper of the Lord. You must religiously observe the Lord's day. You must preserve your own place in life and bed and wealth and name. You must, with the same sincerity, befriend your neighbors also in theirs. Love your neighbors as yourselves and do as you would have done to you. You must deny all ungodliness and worldly lusts and live godly and soberly and righteously in the world. This is that holiness without which no man will see the Lord. I believe that the most obvious application may be drawn from these things that the ministry of the gospel must be attended and not neglected by them who would not neglect the great salvation, a a concerning inference. We have settled the point. Without faith, we can have no salvation. But I assume Romans 10, 14, and 17, how will they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Oh, If only the ungospelized nations which live, I should say which die, without means of salvation would begin to consider it. Your question is answered. O souls in peril, I may now say to you, 1 Corinthians 15.2, You are saved if you keep in memory that I have preached to you. And yet I must say to you, that if after all you trample upon these things, it will be good for you that you'd never been born. The very mention of them will dreadfully increase and inflame your condemnation. But the success of all must be left with the glorious one. And O Father of mercies, do you mercifully look down upon the soul that has heard these things? Dispose and assist that soul to do those good things upon which you have promised the salvation of the soul. Pray you, I pray you. Such a simple question for the sermon. What can I do to be saved? And yet, how few people are asking it. And also, how few people even know they should be asking such a simple question. Many people are not asking, what do I need to do to be saved? Because they don't realize they're in danger of anything. You know, I've heard, uh, we've talked about people saying, you know, should we tell everyone the truth? How far should we go in warning them about hell? And we had a revived conversation even on this subject. But when I look at sermons by people like Cotton, and I look at, you know, we mentioned Jonathan Edwards at the top too, and I look at these guys and I go, they really seem to preach the truth with urgency because they really seem to believe that the souls that they were speaking to would be in trouble someday if they didn't. And I think that all of us need to remember that as we live our life, as we go about all the different things going on, as we worry about the future, We also need to remember that the people we see have souls and we need to remember that they will go somewhere and let us be as urgent about telling them that they need to be saved so that they can ask us and they can ask us and say, what do I need to do to be saved? And we can give them that answer.
Thank you for listening to today's episode of Revived Thoughts. Today's sermon was narrated by John Rayner. If you like today's episode, check out our website at revivedthoughts.com. You can also follow us on social media. It's exciting to have John Raynor back on the show. And we are going to run a segment after our, our credits here. Links are also in the description. Yeah, John is great. And he has a podcast. We really encourage you to go subscribe to this. Yeah, actually, I think last week we also encouraged people to check out IA show uh, from one of our speakers. But what can I say? We have a lot of podcasters who help us make this show possible, and we love them all. And John has a show, Pre-Game Proverbs where he goes through Proverbs and he kind of connects them to your life. They're really short, um, good for listening in the morning. You know, just a quick something, just a quick Devo to kind of get you going through the day. Pre-game Proverb, you can check it out. It's a part of the Bar Network. Uh, But yeah, go check it out. Make sure you subscribe. And big thank you to John for this episode. He does great work. This is Troy and Joel, and this is Revive Thoughts. The Pre-game Proverb, a biblical way to start the day. Here's John Rayner. Check in now with our Ecclesiastes. Beginning of chapter 2 has Solomon continuing his pursuit of enlightenment and telling us what he found out. And in the rearview mirror, we have from the last chapter, Solomon trying out wisdom and knowledge and learning all there is to know, and he finds no happiness. And so now, as we open up chapter 2, Solomon says, I'm going to turn to pleasure. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, Solomon says, I said to myself, come now. I will test you with pleasure, so enjoy yourself. And behold, it too was futility. I said of laughter, it is madness, and of pleasure, what does it accomplish? And that's the end of the scripture today. So gratifying one's desires does not bring about happiness. It's like being hungry and then we binge eat. The food tastes great going in, but what about when it sits in our stomach with that giant cinder block of junk for the next six hours as we wait for it to digest? And what about booze? That buzz that comes from drinking is also just kind of a fleeting pleasure, right? You enjoy it for about an hour, hour and a half, but what about the day and a half hangover that comes after it? Is it really worth it? And Solomon also explores humor or comedy when he says, I said of laughter, but it is madness, as in not good. It's a negative thing. And we look at that. Most comedians are incredibly broken people. An unfortunate example of this was Robin Williams, who took his own life. We don't find true fulfillment in laughter or pleasure. And in the previous chapter, contentment did not come from studying the arts or the philosophies. We're reminded that true happiness only comes from realizing how damaged we are and that we can't make ourselves happy on our own. The only one who can show us our sin and more importantly redeem us from our wicked ways and make us turn away from that sin, that person is Christ Jesus. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Take care of yourself and God bless. The Pre-Game Proverb with John Rayner. Look for it on all podcast platforms and have it delivered to your smartphone. The Pre-Game Proverb, proud partners of The Bar, the biblical and reformed podcast network. Annie had an earache on a Saturday of all days. So her mom brought her to Minute Clinic at CVS, where you can see a provider, fill a prescription, and grab essentials like pain relief products, all in one visit even on evenings and weekends. You can even see us online with telehealth options. For quality, affordable care on your schedule, visit Minute Clinic at CVS. That's healthier made easier. Services vary by location. See MinuteClinic.com for details. Hear that? Is that America cheering or a sausage patty sizzling to perfection? It's time to cheer for Egg McMuffin and fresh cracked eggs at McDonald's. It's time to wake up to the aroma of freshly baked biscuits and treat yourself to a real honest-to-goodness morning meal. Breakfast, it's on at McDonald's. Now enjoy a large iced coffee for just 2 bucks and a breakfast sandwich to make a meal. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal.